The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as it is sometimes known. These online events are made possible through the generous support of the Avatar Alliance Foundation. My name is Veronique LaCapra. Tonight's Ocean Encounters discussion is about extreme ocean machines exploring impossible places. Before we get to the main event, I'd like to find out where all of you are calling in from, tuning in from today, I should say, on Zoom. If you have joined us on Zoom, you should see a pop-up poll on your screen any second now. Um, and it'll ask you where to indicate the region where you live. The poll choices don't cover everywhere, but please pick the one that's closest to where you are. While the poll's running, here are some tips on how you can optimize your Zoom event experience with us. Later on tonight, our panelists will be taking questions from all of you. If you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your question in the window that appears. You may be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but please use the Q&A button instead. As we often get hundreds of questions, uh, we may not be able to get all, to all of yours while we're live, but our goal will be to post answers to as many questions as we can following the program. You can ask questions anytime starting now. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event and that recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. We should be getting our poll results here pretty soon. I'll just, uh, there we go. And we've got, uh, as expected, we have about uh, half of folks from the Eastern US. Uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is, is located on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Um, but we really have people from all over the place. There's 17% calling in from the Western US and also a handful of people calling in from overseas. So that's really terrific. All right, let's get started. Darkness, crushing pressures, and freezing temperatures. Those are just a few of the challenges of exploring our extreme ocean world. With us this evening are five pioneering individuals who know all about the immense difficulties and rewards of exploring the most remote parts of the ocean and sharing the extraordinary stories of their experiences with all of us back on land. They are Andrew Bowen from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Mark Dalio and Vincent Parabone from Ocean X, and Orla Doherty from BBC Studios. Joining them is our very special guest host for this evening, renowned explorer, ocean explorer, and filmmaker, James Cameron, who will lead the group in a conversation about the revolutionary technologies that are empowering new generations of explorers, scientists, and storytellers on the high seas. Jim, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Well, thanks, Veronique. This is going to be really cool. Uh, we've already got tons of questions from, uh, from uh, people coming in from all over the place. And this is really a special event for me because I get to be on this panel with uh, four good friends of mine. Some of them go back, um, I'd say, 25 years, something like that. And others I've known for, uh, for at least a decade. Uh, and they're friends and fellow explorers and fellow uh, uh, filmmakers uh, who are bringing back some absolutely inspiring images from the from the deep ocean. I don't. Um, I still have a couple to come to come on. We got Andy to come on yet, and uh, who else are we missing? Well, hopefully Andy will join us in a second. So, uh, well, I look. You know, tonight's subject is extreme machines. So that's how we get down to the deepest depths um, of the ocean and how we give ourselves more time there. Obviously, a human being can hold their breath, and I happen to know some of the, the world's top breath hold divers, and they can go down hundreds of feet, and they can stay down for five, six, seven minutes. But, you know, obviously, to spend any time underwater, we have to have some kind of a machine, whether it's a scuba tank on our back, whether we're inside a submersible and we're a little bit more comfortable than that, 
uh, or whether we're looking through the eyes, the camera eyes of a robotic vehicle that we're flying around down there. Um, or if we're, or sometimes our machines uh, go out and do the exploring for us, like with the autonomous underwater vehicle. So we're going to talk about these extreme machines that are right at the, at the cutting edge of ocean exploration, the deepest, the farthest, the longest going under ice, all of those amazing things. And everybody on our group here can, can speak to all of those. Um, but really what these machines represent is our passion, our curiosity as human beings for seeing what's down there and seeing what amazing creatures are there and learning how they live, how they survive, how they interact, how they exist in a, in a greater kind of food web and a, a greater ecosystem and how that in turn impacts us back here on land, how it affects our lives. You know, where does our oxygen come from? And simple questions like that. Where is the carbon in our atmosphere going? There are so many important questions that affect our survival right here on Earth uh, that are being answered by these machines and these people that build these machines and, and operate them. And that's, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, I've had a passion for the deep ocean for years since I was a little kid. And uh, that's taken me into making feature films about it and then subsequently documentaries and then even building my own uh, extreme machines as well, both to get in and dive and to explore robotically as well and, and to, do, to do imaging. So these are the subjects that you know, my, my fellow panelists here tonight can, can speak to with, with uh, um, great uh, personal experience. So I think we should just kind of get going on that. And um, uh, is Andy with us? I don't see him. Is he? Is he? I'm, I'm here. Oh, you're there. You're there. For some reason, I'm not yeah, seeing Yeah, like him. magic. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let, let's let your beautiful face fill the frame for a second. Um, so let's start by asking a pretty simple question, which is, we're land animals. So why is it so important for us to explore and learn about the ocean? And you've got a unique perspective on this because for 35 years, You've been building vehicles and you've been going out to sea, you've been deploying them, putting them down there and bringing back images from, you know, literally the most extreme places on the planet. So tell us what got you into it. Yeah, well, I'm, <clears throat> as pretty much everyone who's joined us this evening knows, the ocean is a critical part of uh, this sort of global ecosystem uh, and understanding it is really critical to our future. You know, given as, as you pointed out, Jim, how remote and difficult it is to access that, we have to rely on tools. And my career here at the Oceanographic as an engineer has really been in the um, design development and operation of those tools. I, I think one of the takeaways uh, for everyone is that uh, really there's no one tool that uh, that satisfies all the needs and really um, the emphasis that I'd like to leave or, or the thoughts I'd like to leave with people is that it's a it's a uh, kind of an increasingly diverse set of tools that are key to our increased understanding of the ocean. Uh, you know, during my time at Hui, it's been a fantastic ride. It's not over yet uh, by any means, uh, you know, but there's no better place to make a difference, which has really been an incredible uh, ride and very satisfying. Yeah, let me just second that. I mean, Hui is an amazing organization, and I, I think I, I met you there in, in, I want to say, 88, maybe, when I was researching the abyss and I wanted to know about remotely operated vehicles, but why don't you take us a little bit through the history of the development of these uh, deep ocean tools that let us get down there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, in thinking about this uh, this presentation, it's it's hard not to cover um, a f like. Well, I'm going to try and cover quickly a hundred a hundred years, and and during that time, I sort of see uh, four phases. Uh, you know, the the first three of which are really about expeditions. So this is uh, taking the technology out into the field, often on ships, uh, with a hypothesis that a researcher has and actually going about uh, doing that specific uh, expedition. Um, you know, the key cornerstone to the sort of expeditionary science, I guess, I would think of as the human occupied submersible. And, uh, you know, those were sort of uh, in development as uh, in the 19, late 1920s and 30s. Uh, and 
uh, you know, Woods Hole was uh, was lucky enough to pioneer uh, part of this, and you're seeing some footage uh, really about the sort of jewel in our crown, which is the Alvin submersible. It takes three people down. It's uh, st something we started working with, with in the 1960s. And I think by the 1970s, it became a, a valuable and acknowledged tool. This is a picture taken uh, in 1986, I think, of Alvin and a young Andy Bowen engineer here uh, working with uh, uh, what at the time was one of the earliest sort of versions of tethered vehicles. You can maybe make it out on the front of Alvin is Jason Jr., which we used in 1986 to explore the Titanic. And that's sort of the second phase, tethered vehicles, uh, remotely operated vehicles. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, by sort of the late 1990s, I think that those tools became acknowledged. And more recently, we've uh, added what are termed autonomous underwater vehicles. And these are essentially kind of equivalent to underwater drones. Um, and so they would basically have no people on board. They have no tether. They have carry all their power on board, but they have a program and they undertake uh, a range of tasks that complement the other two systems. The, the sort of fourth part of this, which we'll get into, I hope, a little bit later, is, is, is combining all of these tools and actually uh, sort of distributing uh, them over much larger areas. That, that's great, Andy, and, and we'll, I think we'll come back to all those, those subjects. Um, so, uh, Vince, you are kind of an outlier here because you're a neuroscientist who is now expressing his passion for the ocean, and you've become the vice chairman at OceanX. Why don't you, you tell us a bit about what a neuroscientist is doing uh, hanging out in the ocean? Yeah, well, thanks, Jim. Yeah, it, it turns out that all my life I've spent studying how the brain works and it's very complicated and difficult. And I, a few years ago, I don't know, so it was seven or eight years ago, I realized that the tools that we had in our, that we had developed were just not sufficient for this. And so we had the bright idea that it would, we would transform nerve cells so that they would report what they were doing electrically by producing optical signals like flashes of light and changes in their color. Uh, but to do that, we needed really special proteins that we couldn't invent and we couldn't find. And it turns out those proteins existed only in the ocean. Hmm. So I, I ventured back into the water after being a kid who loved it when I was young and uh, was, fell in love with the ocean and thought I'd be a marine biologist when I was a kid. As I grew up, I realized, well, that wasn't going to happen. And I was enjoying my life as a neuroscientist. And suddenly late in my career, uh, this pops up. And I thought, what a great time to go back in the water. So these images are images of these proteins that live in these only in corals and other animals that live in the ocean. And we extract the DNA from those and we can put them in nerve cells and make the nerve cells light up in a way that tells us what they're doing. So suddenly I found like my best research tools were coming out of the ocean. And that's how I got involved with this and ended up with OceanX and it's, it's been fruitful ever since. Well, look, here's a question from the audience. It sounds like it's up your alley. Um, it's um, why, um, what is different about life on the earth and life underwater? So, Good question. And, and, and today, as it stands, there are whole phylums of animals that are only in the ocean. And since life, no doubt, began in the ocean, expanded and you know, grew up in the ocean, and there are several body plans and things that can't exist on Earth, jellyfish, these kind of things, they only live in the ocean. So life in the ocean for all life, including humans, is a totally different environment to be in. As everyone knows, obviously, it's water and not air. But as you go deeper, it gets colder, it's completely dark, the pressure, the, the, the salt and everything puts extreme, pre extreme like problems with living in that environment, extreme pressure on how to survive. So what we're talking about today in, in, in man submersibles is the way we have to protect humans to get them into this deep environment. But don't forget, there's a lot of animals outside that sphere that live quite happily in the deep environment. So it, it offers for people like myself a place to find very bizarre animals with very bizarre biochemistry. And that biochemistry can be useful when you transplant it back to the surface. So that's my rationale to being down in there. But also it, it's a, an amazing thing to see an animal that you're sitting inside your titanium sphere crouched down and what swims by you is a little fish just kind of waving at you from the outside and saying, no problem for me to live out here. Pretty impressive in my book. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing the things that you see down there. And it, it just really asks more questions. And it, it's always fascinating to me how scientists from all 
different realms and different schools of investigation get attracted to some of these problems in the in the deep ocean. I want to talk to Mark Dalio, my friend, who's uh, a fellow filmmaker. Mark, you're the founder and the creative director at OceanX. I want you to tell us a bit about that. And you know, uh, OceanX is a is a cutting edge ocean exploration and it initiative, but it's also a media company. So as a filmmaker, you know, what how does that come together for you? How does your curiosity and passion for the ocean express itself as a as a filmmaker? Yeah, thank you for the introductions. Um, well, when we first when I first founded Ocean X, there weren't many organizations, uh, if any, um, that both combined the operational uh, this of a research vessel with uh, the operations of filmmaking and really had a strong backbone uh, in both. Uh, and so being able to uh, take these scientists on board and really utilize them um, to uncover uh, discoveries that, that, that uh, would better uh, kind of allow uh, the world to connect both uh, intellectually um, and scientifically, but also uh, with an emotional uh, connection. And I think that uh, it all started for me um, right around the time that uh, we first uncovered the first footage of the giant squid uh, in its mm -hmm. natural behavior. Um, and I think from there, it kind of clicked that um, could we, as an organization, um, create that spark that Jacques Cousteau did many years ago uh, that inspired so many of today's ocean explorers and pioneers uh, that are out in the field. Uh, and then use that as, uh, or do a similar model uh, as that uh, for some of the kids and, and, and the public uh, in today's world. Yeah, and the thing about Cousteau was he always took scientists with him. And his one rule was, if you, if you come out with me on Calypso, you must publish. So you're providing a platform now with probably the most advanced ship in the, in the world for science as, as well as media. So how do you see the role of scientists in, in all this? We think of the engineering challenges of building these machines, but how does science push these these uh, pioneering technologies? Yeah, well, without scientists, I think that um, we wouldn't have any of these uh, amazing pieces of technology. And I think that um, a lot of that uh, comes because uh, they face challenges. Um, and in order to overcome those challenges, they create these amazing uh, pieces of kit uh, to allow them to uncover the, the mysteries that lie below. And one of the scientists that really um, I was inspired by was E.D. Witter, um, who was the scientist that actually was uh, utilized uh, the e-jelly uh, mm -hmm. to uh, uncover the, the photo, first footage of the giant squid. And as you can see in the video that's playing right now, um, the e-jelly uh, acts as almost like a burglar alarm, uh, and it makes this light that then attracts uh, a predator, uh, or attracts a, if it's getting um, eaten, it attracts another predator, uh, i.e. the the uh, squid, and we actually took uh, Edie again uh, into uh, the uh, hunting grounds of the Humboldt squids uh, for Blue Planet 2. And as you can see in the video, uh, we encountered lots of squid actually trying to attack the e jelly, uh, similar to how we uh, filmed the, the giant squid, um, which is a, an amazing uh, occurrence. And Edie Witter's uh, amazing woman really pioneering uh, uh, the, the, the way we. Uh, kind of communicate with animals as well as um, attract them. Well, I mean, that's amazing footage. And, and I've been lucky enough to see the Humboldts and they're very, very aggressive animals. And that was a very important piece of research. And I believe that uh, Orla, you you witnessed that your, yourself. And I, th I think that footage is from your uh, BBC production, uh, Blue Planet 2, which is one of the most beautiful and, am and amazing uh, pieces of filmmaking on the, on the ocean that's ever been done. And uh, I just want to ask you, you know, when you, when you make something like, like Blue Planet, Blue Planet 2, you're seeing the, uh, the animals in their natural habitat and so on. We're not so aware of the machines that you need to use to get down there. And, but this is a show on extreme machines. So let's talk about your curiosity for the ocean. What took you here to this role that you play now and, and how the machines play a role? Uh, well, I was I was pretty late coming to the ocean. Um, I didn't really go on the water until I was 30. Um, very good friend said, go scuba diving, you're going to love it. And I did, and mm -hmm. he was right. 
And that completely changed the course of my life. I then chose to leave my TV career behind me and go and study the coral reefs of the Pacific, which is where I met you out there. Um, for me, I'm, I'm, I am a scientist also. So for me, it, was, it wasn't just this place is beautiful and amazing and full of these wacky characters. It was also to try and understand what are we doing to these coral reefs and how can we, you know, this was back in the 90s, early 2000s. We already knew coral reefs were in serious trouble. Anyway, fast forward uh, 10, 15 years, and then I find myself amongst this team making Blue Planet 2. And for us to tell these, um, that's me in, on one of my very first sub dives in an extreme machine, because for us to tell extraordinary stories from the ocean, we need hefty machinery. We either need subs to get us down, 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 or, you know, if you want to film a story about a clownfish that lays its eggs in a particular way to ensure survival, you need to spend hours down there. So you need to be on a rebreather. That, that is an extreme machine. Our cameras, the finickiest things that known to man need machinery to case them to get them down there and work. So I've sort of, I've gone from very, very low tech, living on a sailboat, poking around in coral reefs to uber high tech quite mm -hmm. quickly. Well, let's follow, let's follow up on that idea. Uh, so, Orlo, this question looks like it's made for you. Um, what is the most impossible place you've ever been to in the ocean, and how did you get there? Uh, hands down, a thousand meters deep, beneath icebergs that were crashing around, bumping into each other, terrifying us, um, and we didn't want to get trapped in between them as they were smashing and crashing. Uh, in Antarctica. So we wanted to go as part of Blue Planet 2. Part of my story was to talk about the richness of the deep sea. And it couldn't be richer in Antarctica because you've got hyper cold, hyper oxygenated water that is feeding a seabed, which we discovered because we were the first people to get there, um, to be as rich as a coral reef with all this color, with sponges the size of a car. Mm -hmm. Maybe not an American car, but definitely a British car. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, just life, crazy, crazy life forms that were uh, startling, gobsmacking, and beautiful all at the same time. And an impossible yeah. place to be surrounded by it. Yeah, and how did you get there? You were, were you in one of these bubble subs, one of these acrylic subs? Yeah. Yep, in, uh, with Mark. Mark was with, with, with me on Alusha, and we had two subs so that we could film from sub to sub. We could use one sub to light for right. the other sub to film. Yeah. Extremely. Well, yeah, so you were in a sub, but there's another way to explore the, the ocean, which is to use a robotic vehicle. And I've seen them, as you pointed out earlier, Andy, deployed from a sub, like when Jason Jr. You know, got off and explored around the wreck of Titanic. Um, or you can send them down from the surface. There's all different kinds of configurations. So why don't you talk a little bit, a little bit about the, uh, the role of uh, robots in deep sea exploration? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, again, as I suggested at the beginning, it's a sort of horses for courses, but they're all sort of uh, complementary, I guess. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, again, this, this submersible is sort of the cornerstone, but autonomous vehicles are, are really, I think, changing the game. Uh, and the one that we've been operating here at Woods Hole uh, uh, for the scientific community is one of many uh, sort of diverse platforms that have this sort of autonomy. Uh, it's called Sentry, and it's used in conjunction with uh, with the with the album Submersible, for example, to sort of do the reconnaissance mission that uh, allows uh, things like Alvin or Jason to be used uh, most effectively. So in this animation, it's using cameras to map the seafloor or sonar systems. And increasingly, it's getting more sophisticated with regard to the types of sensors that it can uh, deploy. And uh, hopefully we'll talk for, uh, in a minute about sort of the machines getting, getting smart. Uh, you know, I think you 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 uh, pointed out uh, a number of years ago that nobody wants to grow up to be a robot, and that, that that's uh, really an important point here. And I I think that it's the 
teaming of the robots with the humans that are really uh, a critical aspect. I think it's going to be a long time before uh, machines have this sort of ability to assimilate an unknown environment, which of course much of the ocean is, as rapidly as humans can. Uh, and uh, and I, th I think it's, uh, again, the, the, the idea that these two tools together are greater than their individual parts by summing them together. Absolutely. We're, we're so very limited and the robots can stay down for hours, days, weeks sometimes, but they don't have curiosity and they don't have that discriminatory kind of uh, uh, intelligence that allows them to say, oh, that's something interesting over there. I'm going to stop and reprioritize my mission. We're getting there, though. I mean, I think that that'll happen. I mean, a lot of people think that, um, you know, space is the most challenging environment to build machines to go into and for humans to work in. But I don't know if that's really true. Um, Vince, do you want to comment on the, the special challenges of exploring the ocean? Yeah, I mean, it, it, we spend a lot of time in the world talking about space travel and the difficulties of it. And, and I would argue that the launches are tough, obviously. The travelers <laughs> are tough. They but underwater, water. <laughs> yeah, it's totally different. You get down deep, you have thousands of pounds of pressure per square inch on your body. And you, humans simply can't survive. So we have to surround ourselves in these, you know, steel and titanium machines. But even that is extremely challenging. And as Andy will know that the sphere in Alvin is this precisely machined titanium sphere that has to be very perfect. Otherwise it will collapse and collapsing underwater is a dangerous thing. So you've got the pressure in perpetual darkness. It's just, an, I, I was not quite aware of how difficult that kind of environment is to create machines. And of course, machines that we're talking about here are all electronics. So electronics did not love salt water. So that's a bad combination. So you're encapsulated. They need to be protected from the pressure and the cold. You know, everything below a thousand feet is like zero degrees or four degrees, very, very cold. So it's a really hostile environment to work in. And there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of things that go wrong. You know, if you have a, if you have a small volume of air on one of your, your um, instruments or your machines and that volume implodes, the damage is, 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 it can be catastrophic at those depths. The forces are so enormous. So it's a, it, in that, and in space, it's a vacuum. And I want to say that that's not bad, but, but putting, you know, 20, um, you know, buses on top of you is what we'd have to deal with at depth. So it's in many ways a harsher and more difficult environment to live in. Well, here's you know, like a question. Animals have figured it out. So for us as biologists, how they manage to survive in that extreme environment is just a paramount interest and importance to all of us. Well, we talk about these machines, but we have to imagine that every, every machine has the soul of the engineer that, that built it in it, you know? And so, um, you know, the machines are an expression of ourselves and our imagination, our ability to solve problems. So I want to talk to an engineer on this and follow up on this with a question from the audience. So Andy, for you, what are the most difficult problems for engineers uh, to solve in building extreme ocean machines? Well, Jim, I'm going to start off by saying probably the biggest challenge is overcoming your grief when you make a mistake or uh, yeah. something horrible happens. And I, I, this, I can't really do it justice, but this is a piece of our deep diving robot, which, uh, which is all we got back pretty much from uh, a horrible accident where uh, the vehicle imploded at a depth of uh, over 30,000 feet in the uh, Kermadec Trench. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's an incredibly uh, demanding environment to operate in uh, because of the pressures that Vincent says, and as you know, uh, but because it's at the remote reaches of, uh, of the planet. Um, and, you know, we operated uh, recently uh, at 85 degrees north, uh, way up uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and I was humbled once again, you know, uh, by our um, experiences there. Uh, we used our sort of hybrid vehicle. It's called uh, Nereid, uh, deployed it from a Norwegian icebreaker. Uh, but I have to tell you, it, it, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, and um, we m pretty much lost. Uh, I, uh, you know, for a time during that trip, had made my peace with the idea that Neriad had disappeared under the ice. We were lucky enough to get it back. Uh, 
But I think it's all just to tell you that it's, a, a, you know, uh, Bob Ballard's fond of uh, saying that it's a contact sport and he's absolutely right. Uh, um, but the key is uh, learning from your experiences and, uh, you know, uh, delivering those to the next generation. Um, you know, I'm fond of sort of saying, uh, uh, you know, you can maybe see the future uh, after having done this for a, a long time, uh, but you can't live it. And the best thing to do is sort of set the stage and get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, the most the, the future is most visible when it's in your rearview mirror, I've found. <laughs> Indeed. And so, you know, I mean, but the point of that is you're going into the unknown every time you build one of these things. Not only you're going to you're going to bring new technology into the field and the field is going to try to kick your ass. So I always say to my engineers, you know, hope is not a strategy, <laughs> you know, test, test, test. Uh, so Orla, you shared earlier a little bit about being under some icebergs. And so talk a little bit more about what it's like to be in a sub and, and what the what the dangers are that you can experience in, a, in, uh, in that type of exploration. Okay, so there's a, there's a clip that's, that's going to come up um, to show our very first dive in Antarctica. So uh, there's the beautiful Alusha. I'm on it, Mark's on it, um, and we're just heading down. That's the hatch closing, and we are, that's me inside, Gavin next to me, and Ralph the pilot behind. And here we go into this, what looks like beautiful balmy water. Wouldn't you like to go diving in that? That's minus 1.8. Celsius, 28 Fahrenheit, that is very, very cold water. And because it's very cold water, what it had done on our descent, we're, here we are going down hundreds and hundreds of meters, um, was shrink one of the seals. And what you can't hear is Ralph's alarm has just gone off saying uh, leak. So we're at 450 meters and we have got water in the bottom of the submersible, which is why I'm bending down and I'm now licking it to find out is that salt water big problem or fresh water maybe we've knocked over a water bottle it's salt water nah. so this is uh, our very first dive we knew we were going out there you know pushing boundaries going to new places trying to find new things but and taking calculation risks um, but this wasn't kind of you know the ideal first dive down there long story short 20 minutes later found the leak leaks closed we carry on diving. <laughs> I've had a very similar experience. I managed to convince the pilot if we just kept going deeper, the hatch would seat better. <laughs> did that work? No, we had to track down the leak <laughs> and, and, and stop it. But we did, and we carried on. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it gets your attention, there, yeah. for sure. It makes you very aware of the of the pressure mounting up outside. So here's a, here's a similar question. Uh, let's, Vince, maybe you can answer this. Um, what is the craziest thing you've seen or done in the ocean that you can talk about? <laughs> well, we, would, we were doing, uh, actually on Aleutia, we were in uh, Solomon Islands. Um, I think Mark was with me that one as well. I don't think Orla was there. We were looking around for these proteins we care about at night, um, these glowing ones that I just showed you. And uh, I would say we were about, I don't know, 30, 40 feet maybe. It was very shallow diving and uh, lights on looking for these glowing things. And I sort of drifted off uh, away from the rest of the group. And suddenly this bizarre phenomenon appeared. And I think we have a short clip to, of what happened that night, which is impossible to ever capture on film. But what happened was, um, unbeknownst to us, about a thousand flashlight fish had come up from the deep and they had been streaming up through the water around us. And what looks here like a, a bunch of flashing lights was this entire sinuous uh, explosion of these fish. And they're these tiny fish. We didn't know what they were because we couldn't see them because it was complete darkness. And it was, a, it was a psychedelic experience to see this huge, weird flashing. And we were not even aware the animals were there, that they'd come up from the deep to do this. They sort of streamed up in, then we would turn our lights on and we couldn't see what it was. And it wasn't until one of us tracked them down and figured out it was a single fish, but there were thousands of them in the water that night. And it was a shocking experience because you see these occasionally one or two of them, but to see thousands of them at night streaming along in the reef was an absolute breathtaking and unforgettable experience for me. And I, I ranked that up there as one of the most spectacular moments of my life, actually. 
That's what I love about diving. You never know when the ocean is going to, you know, throw you a curveball that's a negative, like a leak or some other thing, underwater avalanche or whatever. And you never know when it's going to give you a gift like that. And for you to be able to bear witness to that, that uh, movement, that daily migration up and down through the water column that happens down in the twilight zone. Most people don't understand that the greatest mass movement on earth of, of, of biomass is taking place every single day in the ocean and as it oscillates down by day and up at night to feed. And the bioluminescence is a big, big part of that. Mark, um, here's a good question for you. Are there any technologies that have allowed you to conduct your work differently and eliminate any negative impact that filming might have on the ocean environments. Yeah, so uh, we actually got approached um, last year um, by the Cape Luther Institute uh, in Florida State University, Coastal Marine Lab, um, with the aim to be the first ever to tag a six scale shark um, mm -hmm. um, by at depth. Um, and no one's ever been able to tag um, an animal with the deep sea submersible before. Uh, and what you have uh, is six skulls are these incredible uh, prehistoric sharks that existed at the same time as the dinosaurs uh, and mostly inhabited the bottom of the sea floor uh, at extreme depths. Um, and normally when you're tagging these sharks, you have to capture them in the same uh, way a commercial fishery would uh, pretty much by hauling them up with the long line through hundreds of meters uh, to tag, measure, and release them. And it usually creates a lot of stress for the shark um, and a lot of trauma. Um, and then you have to swim them uh, down below again, uh, as you can see. Um, and so by using uh, the submersible, um, as you can see in the next clip, we were able to uh, attach a tagging device onto uh, the submarine. Um, and then we took it uh, to depth. Um, and as you can see right here, uh, this is the tagging sequence. And it was quite uh, stunning. I, I, actually, my first sub dive uh, um, ever, uh, a six gill, uh, came and, and, and rubbed against the sub. So um, <laughs> it, it's nice to be able to uh, come a full circle and, and be able to tag uh, for the first time uh, the, the six gill. And it, uh, the whole team was absolutely thrilled uh, to be a part of that. Um, well, that was the ocean giving you a gift now, wasn't it? That that six gill showed up, but you couldn't have received it if you hadn't been there in a sub and with the technology, so you, you prepared. So fortune favors the prepared mind. Um, so, okay, so here's a question that's, that's a, the big hot button issue uh, in uh, human occupied vehicles, piloted submersibles versus robotics. And I shouldn't say versus because of course, I think we know what the answer is. We, we want them both, but this is an audience member uh, who's going to uh, hit a nerve simultaneously for all of us on this program. With the dawn of underwater robotics, is there still a need for human-occupied vehicles in ocean science? And let's uh, let's see who's best. Uh, I'm going to oh L. I'll just do it myself. So <laughs> <laughs> Jim and Jim elaborates. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, it's all tightly scripted, guys. I know this is going to come as a shock to you. Um, well, look, I, can, I think I can speak for my colleagues. We, we constantly talk about this. There are, there are things that human beings can do that robots can't do. The robots can go, when I say robots, it could be one that we're piloting ourselves on a long tether. It might be a fiber optic tether. I know, Andy, you, you've built machines that go out on fiber tethers that are 10, 20 miles long and almost as fine as a, as a human hair. Uh, or it can be a coarser tether that has power running, running through it as well. Uh, and, and those are uh, tethered ROVs, basically. Um, so when we say ro robotics, it's a kind of a general term. It also in includes free swimmers that have to make their own decisions as well. And then there's human-occupied vehicles. We like them all. The answer is E, all of the above. Because, uh, you know, if you're piloting, you might be piloting a robotic vehicle across the sea floor for, for many days. I mean, you could, you could shift out the, the drivers and the pilots and you could go for many days and cover a lot of territory. Um, but there's nothing like that experience of actually being there. I, I call it bearing witness. There's something very, very exciting about being physically present and you're using all your senses. 
So a lot of the bioluminescence that we saw was captured by specialized low light cameras, but you had to know it was there. Somebody had to have witnessed it. I always think of the, of the um, uh, scientist who was studying the hydrothermal vents and she turned off uh, Van, Van Dover. She turned off the lights and she could actually see this very, very faint glow of a vent light. And it was an unexplained phenomenon at the time. And so then people had to devise low light cameras to be able to record that and all these other phenomena. There's also a situational awareness you have as a, as a human sitting there in situ. Plus you can come back and tell the story and that engages an audience. And if we don't have storytelling is an important, uh, the most important aspect of exploration in my mind is coming back and telling the tale to have gone and seen and born witness and then come back and not tell anybody about it and not bring the pictures is not playing fair. We want our human you know, tip of the spear, our, our human avatars to go down there for us and, and come back and tell the rest of us what it's like, all the people that can't go, that, that aren't uh, blessed to be able to dive uh, thousands of meters under the, under the surface. So we all believe, I think on this call, and again, I'm speaking for my colleagues, but we talk a lot, um, that you need all the tools. You need the human mind, the human curiosity, you need it in situ, but the robotics are very, very powerful for getting in places you can't, for durations that you can't, and at price points that you can't. Because human, human occupied vehicles tend to be, you know, uh, a multiple of expense over a robotic vehicle, uh, sometimes together the same image or the same, the same sample. So we need, them, we need them all. And we're gonna talk more about swarm robotics and things like that as we go along. Andy, I know can you've I got- you, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're sort of forgetting something, a minor thing, which is that you were this accomplished film director and decided one day to build your own <clears> submersible <throat> and be the only person at the time to travel to the bottom of the Marinus Trench. What inspired that and what was the benefit of that and why did you do that as a man submersible as opposed to doing the robotics yourself? Because you're one of the pioneers of that yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for asking that question. I, my approach to ocean ex exploration started as a filmmaker. I, I made the abyss um, and I, I got fascinated by the robotics and the submersibles. And then I, I wound up doing a series of expeditions. I did seven expeditions over a period of 10 years, going to Titanic, exploring with robotics inside the Titanic while I was literally sitting on the deck of the, of the wreck inside a Russian submersible and then Bismarck and hydrothermal vents and so on, different sites all over the world. And that, that I was down at Bismarck at, at 5,000 meters and I thought, wow, we're almost at the deepest this sub could go, but what if you could go twice this deep? What would we see? And from that moment, I started thinking about it, thinking about the engineering problems and I pulled a team together. And, you know, it's very simple. It's, why wouldn't you, you know? <laughs> I just want to go see it. You know, it's funny when I when I when I do speaking, I, I do speak a little bit about this stuff, and you know, I never get asked why did you do it by uh, by a kid, because a kid always knows the answer already. You know, why wouldn't you do it? And you know, sometimes I'll see a kid in the audience and I'll say, well, well what about you? Wouldn't you build a sub and go to the deepest place on the planet? And he's like, yeah, of course. It's innate to us, right? It's a it's our curiosity. It's our our need to see for ourselves. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw to Andy quickly here. Uh, you know, what, what do you think is the future? Where is this going with robotics? If yeah, you, said, I, you said no robot, no human wants to grow up to be a, a robot. What about robots growing up to be more human like? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a huge subject, right? Making robots more, more like people, I think in the ocean because of the difficulties, some of which we've discussed, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a good distance off, but uh, there are people certainly work, working, uh, on it. I mean, you make a really good point about the idea that humans are an enduring presence in the ocean for sure. But the, some of the technologies we've been talking about, uh, expand our capability. You know, I, I'm sort of fond of saying robots are good at doing what you tell them to do. They're not good at doing what you want them to do, uh, right? And there's a subtle difference between those two ideas. Uh, you know, what you want them or what we want to do is to make discoveries. And I think it'll be a long time before 
uh, uh, you know, robots have uh, go find me a new life form and bring it back. Uh, it's 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 likely to involve you know humans in that loop for a long time to come. Well, so we've been talking about all this great stuff that we've been doing, you know, and we we have these big institutions and big ships and cool, you know, uh, you know, robotics that that we built. But Orla, what do you think about democratizing the process of of exploring the oceans? Uh, I, you know, when I started to dive in subs to make Blue Planet 2, I, I wanted everybody not just to have um, a sub dive, I wanted every single person on this planet to have their own submersible. <laughs> um, that's not a very clever idea because that's never going to happen. Um, and I think what I've learned is you know, it's, it's, it's my job, it's our job as the storytellers to push, to get out there, get the story, bring it home, share it, have people get excited by it. It's the amazing sort of scientific engineering community's job to create these ways of exploring the ocean without even leaving your armchair in Kansas, which mm. you can now do. So, you know, for me, I, I won't ever be satisfied unless I'm actually there. Um, it's kind of old fashioned actually. And I think there's a whole new way of being there, which is happening. It's not futuristic, it's happening. And your goal is to bring it back and share it with everybody. And I know Mark, you share that passion as well. Uh, you know, you're doing uh, Ocean X, which yes, it's about scientific research and cool new cutting edge technology but it's also about inspiring and surprising media, right? So, so tell us about that. Tell, tell us about you as a, an ocean storyteller. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, one of the challenges I think that um, we faced in the previously um, was uh, right when we faced a lot of challenges um, over the years and a lot of them dangerous challenges as you could have seen in uh in orla's clip um but the an issue that kept on plaguing us um was the actual cinematography um at, at mm -hmm. these depths um at a thousand meters um and being able to have uh high quality cameras that uh have manual focus irish zoom um which seems very simple um but we were kind of plagued with this issue uh, that just kept on, on coming up uh, and, and not being able to have the tools um, as a storyteller to be able to, to utilize. And uh, when B Orla and, and the BBC team uh, approached us uh, to be involved in some of the deep sea filming for Blue Planet 2, uh, we knew it was a perfect opportunity to really go uh, and develop a high quality uh, cinema camera uh, first of its kind uh, mm -hmm. to be able to bring 8K uh, cinematography down uh, to a thousand meters. Uh, and so we worked very closely with um, Orla and, and her team, as well as uh, Gates uh, Underwater Cameras and um, Sylvia Earle's company, uh, Dewar, to develop uh, this thousand meter 8K uh, cinema camera that could also house uh, a range of low light cameras like the Canon ME20, which actually has a, a significant um, scientific uses as well to be able to capture footage that uh, you might not even be able to see with the naked eye. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to now have this uh, toolkit, it's really become uh, the workhorse uh, for uh, our team. Um, and we're actually now developing uh, a range of other uh, tools for uh, some 6,000 meter ROVs that were in development. And I think that uh, the imagery is is very important, not just for the storytelling and the inspiration side, but also allows uh, scientists to then go back and review. Because obviously, when they're in the sub, uh, so many ex uh, so many emotions come up, and and so much excitement when you have humbled squids darting through the uh, water, and uh, or or these big methane bubbles coming seeping out. Um, it, it's always great to have that camera and, and get those high speed uh, shots or, or, and then review and, and uh, understand it more fully. So we're gonna, thanks Mark. So we're gonna uh, wrap up pretty soon and then do a, a, a Q and A with the audience, but let's look to the future for a second. So Andy, where's the technology headed next and how are whatever new tools are coming, how is that gonna work with, with people? 
Sure. Yeah. And, and we've got a, a short clip that I think is instructive, right? Our, our uh, director, Mark Abbott, is fond of saying that, uh, you know, uh, a networked ocean with, that's always on is, is part of the future. And I think he's absolutely right. Um, you know, there are uh, projects underway now uh, that are intended to provide that sort of networked ocean. And one of them is off the East Coast of the United States. And this graphic sort of shows, you know, it's at the shelf break, which has got a lot of uh, interesting scientific questions surrounding uh, what goes on there in terms of water flows and the ecology and so forth. And wh what you're seeing here is this whole sort of network. So you've got uh, gliders, you have uh, propelled vehicles living on the seafloor. You have moorings. Uh, they're communicating with each other and sending their information back in near real time. Um, and I think that's a big part of the future in the sense of how we are preparing ourselves to sort of manage the ocean and manage our impact on the ocean and ensure that uh, you know we have uh, the best possible outcome is going to use this type of technology, I think, increasingly. And Vince, what do you think the next generation of, you know, engineers and technologists are going to be able to accomplish? And what, what is that going to mean for the future of ocean science? Yeah, I think, it, I think we need that. We need the young group that's going to come along and apply modern um, networking and autonomous vehicles but also the biology, also you know taking those biological tools and things and thinking about how they how they impact people. I think developing robots that give us. I think you were saying to us the other day we were talking about weather maps. So we have these amazing satellites roaming around, capturing all this current information about weather. And the ocean drives a lot of that weather, and we have no real insight into how that's going, except for these small areas like Andy just showed. So we need that weather map visibility of the ocean, all the depths of the ocean to see what's going on because it impacts us, our livelihood, our lives, our fish, everything around us. So we need this very clear information of the ocean and, and the feedback to us. So we need vehicles that will go out and think on their own, like we said, find a way around in this very harsh environment. So there's, there's a ton of room for, for young scientists, young engineers to come along and help develop and build this generation of tools that would that would elevate our understanding of the ocean and help us avoid the problems and things we see in the ocean today. All right, so Mark, so you're, thanks, thanks Vince, that's great. Um, Mark, you're a, a young storyteller filmmaker that's about to go out on this amazing, uh, you know, multi-year expedition on the coolest ship in the world. Uh, what extreme tech are you gonna be using to, uh, that we might not have seen before? For, and I'm thinking of like the Microsoft HoloLens or, or you know, some of the other ideas that you're exploring. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we're uh, going to be launching uh, the Ocean Explorer, which is one of the most advanced uh, scientific and media uh, ships ever built. Um, it's almost like a floating movie studio after with the latest uh, marine exploration technologies um, and uh, workspaces. And um, in combination with uh, kind of the usual tools that you might find in a vessel like this and uh, with 2,000 meter submersible, 6,000 meter rated ROV, we also have these uh, spaces, um, these labs, uh, and one, one of the um, examples that you're actually bringing up that's, that's excellent is uh, the HoloLens with Microsoft. So we're uh, looking to incorporate uh, the excellent data visualization capabilities of the HoloLens to be able to bring that uh, to the scientists on board um, to really take the data sets that they'll be uh, gathering out in the field and visualize it in a way that allows them to interact and uh, study it uh, like never before. And That's great. I, with BBC as well. I'm so jealous that I'm making these Avatar movies. I'm not going to be on that damn ship with you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to carry the torch. I just want to talk to Orla uh, quickly. Maybe... You've done so much to inspire us, Orla, with uh, BBC Two and and I mean, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Blue Planet Two, and just inspire us about the oceans. And we've talked a lot about these machines that you know can take us into the oceans and and uh, bring back these incredible images. But what if what if we're destroying the ocean faster than we can explore? 
what if the animals are dying faster than we can photograph them and be inspired by them? Do you, are you still hopeful about the future of the ocean and what we can do about it? Yes, because, you know, every single time uh, someone chats to me and says, I saw Blue Planet 2 and now I'm a marine biology major. Right. That, you know, that, that seriously gives me hope because I think what we managed to do is around the world wake up a lot of people to the magnificence, the absolute divine beauty of what's in our ocean and the weirdness and the scary stuff and all of it. And it's through having that passion that you're going to incite somebody to actually get off their sofa and do something about it. But it's not just the marine biologists that are going to fix this. We need we need young Andes. We need young Vincents. We need more Marks. We need more yous. We need more me's. I think most of all, I think we need people to do the maths. And I think we need people to do the maths and tell us how we cannot not afford to take care of our ocean. Yeah. And give us the future rundown of this is what it's going to cost us. Yeah. In money, in health, in food, yeah, in all of that. I mean, get the economists on it, because I think there are some really hard numbers that could scare us into action, and we kind of need to be scared at this point. Well, that's the great debate in it, do, isn't it? Do we do we scare people into action, or or do we or do we promise them an optimistic future if they take little steps? I personally think we have to take big steps, but I think that the the People are not going to fight for what they don't love, and they're going to love it because of the images that you're going to bring back, and that that uh, Vince and Mark are going to bring back, and and uh, that Andy's machines uh, are going to continue to bring back. I mean, that's the that's the fight that we all fight for. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it at that point because we're sort of going out on an upbeat note. We all feel our strong sense of justification and mission. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll start with some audience questions now. And I guess uh, uh, Veronique at uh, Woods Hole, you're going to take over at this point. Is that right? I am. And thank you very much, Jim. And thank you to all of the panelists for that great conversation and discussion. Um, so yes, I do want to get to questions from the audience uh, very quickly. But I'm going to use a little bit of moderator prerogative and uh, ask the first question myself, and this one's going to Orla. Um, oceanography, engineering, and I think filmmaking all suffer from a lack of diversity, particularly at the top. What would you say to a young person watching tonight who's interested in ocean science or technology or outreach, but who's concerned about the discrimination or exclusion that they might face in those careers? Uh, what I say is, Please, dear God, don't let anything stop you. If you've got it in you, wherever you are coming from, we, we need such diversity in perspective, in the way of being with the ocean, understanding the ocean, exploring the ocean. And if everyone looks like all of us, that's not good. Um, we've just been working a lot around the edges of the Indian Ocean and getting to know some incredible scientists in that part of the world. And the way they you know, see uh, what's happening, that, that's a different way of seeing things than from me in, in the UK, from somebody at Woods Hole. So if, if you have anything, just, I've never let anything, I've never let being a woman stop me doing anything I've ever wanted to do. Don't, don't let anything get in your way. Just keep going, just keep knocking on those doors. Don't knock, actually don't knock, just push them wide open. <laughs> Jim, I see you nodding. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, you know, we're uh, as we were sort of crewing up for this big expedition, we knew we were going into the Indian Ocean. Uh, as Orla said, we started looking around for who's working there, who are the scientists that are there. And we found some amazing young women of color, very diverse backgrounds uh, from, uh, from Africa, from India, from you know, Indonesia. We had so many brilliant candidates to choose from, it was actually very hard to literally not cast the entire crew with young women of color from, from that, that area. It was, you know, and this is speaking as an old white guy, you know, uh, 
<laughs> and by the way, look at us, you know, there's me, there's Andy, there's Vince, you know, we're of a generation. Uh, and, you know, the world is changing. And it's not up to us, I think, to change it. It's changing already by itself. Uh, hopefully, we'd like to think it's because, you know, we made some films that inspired people, but they've clearly inspired people of, of all walks of life, gender, culture, and so on. And it's going to take all of us everywhere because the ocean impinges on every uh, every part of the world and affects all of us. Even if we live 1,500 miles inland, we affect the ocean and the ocean affects us. Um, and so we need to be cognizant of those linkages and we need to work together, you know, as all of humanity to solve it. And I love Orla's words of encouragement for anybody that might be watching uh, to just get in there and do it. And I would say that to anyone, just get in there and do it. I, you know, I grew up in landlocked Canada, uh, 450 miles from the nearest ocean. And I'm, I made my father take me to scuba diving lessons. I got certified in a YMCA swimming pool in Buffalo, New York in the dead of winter in February. My first open water dive was in Chippewa Creek and I had no buddy to dive with, so my father tied a rope around my waist at the age of 14 and held on to one end of it like that was going to do some good. <laughs> so just do it. That's the, mod, that's the moral of that, that little story from the old white guy. Just go do it. All right. Well, I'm going to follow up with another question for you, Jim, which is kind of related to that, but it's from Tim about his sons, Miles and Finn, who are ages seven and four, and they want to know how to become underwater explorers. Um, Tim, don't tie ropes around your son's <laughs> waist, uh -huh. but um, any other advice you might have uh, for a father who wants to help his sons get into underwater explorations? Okay. So Miles and Finn wouldn't be asking this question or, or be interested in this, uh, you know, if if they already didn't have the curiosity and so on. So what's the next step, right? Well, on the one hand, it's important to learn some things about the ocean. Uh, and so you have to have a respect for science and math and all that boring stuff in school. But the key to it is to think of science as just an extension. I'm talking to Miles and Finn now, just an extension of your own curiosity. Every kid loves to, you know, see an amazing new bug and study it and go on hikes and see things and ask questions of themselves or whoever's around. It's you just have to extend that into the ocean. And there's plenty of stuff online. There's lots of great films made by made by the documentary filmmakers, you know, on this panel and, and many others. So just start learning about it. And then when the time is right, maybe when you're seven or eight years old, learn how to scuba dive. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Um, I'm gonna give this one to Andy. Um, it's from Joyce. And she asks, how do you decide where and what areas of the ocean to explore? And I might add, are there places you think are understudied that need to be explored more or studied more? Well, uh, you know, it's my job as an engineer, not so much to decide where to explore, but to work with the uh, scientists who have those questions and provide them with access. Um, you know, I think the extreme reaches of the ocean, uh, such as the Hadal Zone or the parts of the ocean that's associated with the trenches where uh, Jim uh, explored with the Deep Sea Challenger and we lost our uh, Nereus robot, you know, is uh, it's the, the amount of time we've spent there is measured in hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the same can be said of the extreme reaches uh, of the poles uh, in the sense that there's really been no uh, science of any, uh, well, I shouldn't say of any significance, but certainly it's undersampled. And I think that those are two areas where there's lots of uh, opportunity to, to learn at a, an incredible pace. But I go back to my first point. You know, uh, I look at myself and people at, uh, at Hui like me, uh, our job is to, you know, work uh, hand in hand with the scientists and provide them with the kind of access that leads to these incredible discoveries. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? I just want to make a comment, you know, Andy, Andy's still living under the burden of having lost the nearest vehicle, unfortunately. But I want to say something. You got down there first and you did the biggest cross range exploration of the of the Challenger Deep to date. You were going miles and miles and miles across this place and and from from one margin of the of you know, because it's a very, very flat bottom, and then there are these 
uh, gently sloping walls. We think of it as this steep canyon, but it's really kind of splayed out. And the funny thing was when I, when I went down there and I landed, when I played the video back later, I realized I landed on your robot's track. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn, the robot beat me to it. <laughs> That's amazing. But, it's, but, but you know what, Jim, it's the, it's the uh, uh, comparison and the teaming of those two things that's really so valuable, I think, right? Uh, and and they're bigger than either of their parts if if they if they work in this collaborative framework. Yeah. Well, let's build some more stuff. Yeah. More adventures. Well, sort of along those lines, here's a question from Jim. He says, "We have the International Space Station and an international consortium that funds ISS and work in space. Why can't we do the same with deep sea exploration and have an international base and labs at the bottom of the Challenger Deep?" Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> we should. We should. It's interesting how we we talk a lot about space exploration and, as humans, but ocean exploration is far more fruitful, somewhat more difficult, and is going to you know result in a whole lot more important things for the human race. I always say that you know that trip to Mars is going to be real exciting for the launch and the landing, and it's going to get real boring after that. Real boring TV when you're walking around on a lyophilized, lifeless you know planet. <laughs> Get to the bottom of the ocean and there's not a place you can go to the ocean that doesn't have some life in it and you can't poke a finger at the depths that jim went with his device and not find something new so it always surprises me that we don't have an international endeavor and maybe that's this generation one of this generation's goals would be to do that set up a international submergence station trademark vincent something that sits <laughs> on the bottom of the ocean and all nations can go down there and be friendly with each other that would be a terrific Cousteau did a st station underwater years ago we haven't done much since. So. Well, you know, the first the first deep sub submersible dives that I did were with the Russians in the in the Russian Mir submersibles, and and so the Russians were reaching out to work with the West on on ocean science and deep submergence uh, even before the the Cold War ended uh, in in 1991 in the fall of the Berlin, Berlin Wall and all that. They were already reaching out and they were sharing information, and I've been sharing information, and Andy, you probably have too, with the Chinese guys who are are building some deep robotics and some uh, some deep vehicles and so on. So there's a natural cooperation already, mm -hmm. but it's almost more because there isn't that much program money out there. It's not coming down from the government. So, um, you know, so everybody has to kind of scrabble around and make their alliances and their, and try to get done what they can get done. So we definitely, we definitely could do a lot more on in that regard because the knowledge that we would get from a kind of real time, understanding through swarm robotics and these free swimmers and gliders and so on of ocean currents and carbon flux and so on would uh, benefit everybody on the planet because they'll answer questions about climate change and, and changing ocean currents and so on that are going to literally affect us all going forward. I think also philanthropy has a huge role here and we see that happening now that a lot of philanthropic endeavors, including the one that we work with, Ocean X, which is the brainchild of Mark and his family, are yeah. investing a credible amount of money into exploring the ocean and really, in some sense, in many ways, leading uh, in these explorations and these vehicles. So we, we have to thank also that and look towards that in the future. Yeah, good, good one. All right, this question is from Georgia. Uh, what piece of technology has been the most influential to research and discovery in the deep? Who would like to take that one? Ooh. Well, I, I've, I've got a nerdy engineer answer to that, uh, you know, and, and I'll say, gosh, uh, you know, um, I think fiber optics is a key um, part and it sounds a little boring, um, but, uh, you know, the same technology that allows us to pick up a telephone and call uh, Europe or anywhere on the planet uh, through um, uh, subsea cables has been a huge uh, enabler, I think, um, for uh, researchers um, in terms of the uh, of, of, a, of an individual technology. Um, it, you know, I think others in the panel will probably have their own take, but that would be um, one of the first ones I'd put on my list. I think syntactic foam is up there somewhere. Yeah. You know? Way better than gasoline. Well, the vehicles came down by practically an order of magnitude in, in, in dry mass, and it, it transformed from these big towed 
kind of steel balloons filled with gasoline that had to be towed to the site to something that was small enough and light enough. And by light, I'm talking about 10 to 20 tons, but light enough that a crane could put it in the water off a ship. Um, and, and that changed everything. So now all our vehicles go over the side. Uh, and this happened back in what, the early 60s? You'd know better than, than me. I think Alvin was the first example. Yeah, certainly amongst one of the first ones, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, gasoline is no uh, reasonable way um, to uh, to provide flotation for sure. <laughs> your, your predecessors, Jim, that went to the bottom of the Marinus Trench, if I'm not mistaken, went with a gasoline. They went in a they went in a I think it was like a hundred ton steel gas balloon. By gas, I mean gasoline, because nobody had figured out a substance that could still have flotation when it got to the bottom of the ocean and got squoze down and everything else would go negative, you know? And then somebody got the bright idea of putting little tiny glass microspheres into an epoxy matrix and glass is the strongest material in compression that we know. So, you know, that became the, the engineering hack of the, of the early sixties that, that informed uh, basically an entire generation of vehicles uh, down to right now. All right, I'm getting uh, prodded that it's time to wrap up. I just want to say that we had over 2,500 people join us tonight uh, and over 900 questions, but I want to sneak in one last question and it's from Connor, who's six years old. And I, I'd like each one of you to answer this just, you know, like basically with a phrase real quick. What type of food do you take down with you when you go down in a sub? He wants to know if it's like the astronauts or uh, I'm sort of curious, like, do you have a favorite food that you must take, like your favorite candy bar or something like that, that you must have with you? Um, all right, so just go uh, around. Uh, uh, Granola bars. <laughs> Granola bars from Vince. Fresh water. <laughs> what was that? Granolas and fresh water. Yeah, fresh water. Um, Orla? Um, chocolate and really quite a lot of chocolate and in fact there was one trip uh that i was on and gavin the cameraman and i ate all the chocolate on the ship which on alusha is an impossible feat it's the best stock ship on planet earth and we drained the supplies there's a lot of chocolate yeah. mark what's what's your favorite thing to take down in a sub with you our sub pilot loves Tim Tams, um, and is that is that the right <laughs> one? Um, and we don't have them in the U.S., but uh, he's from the U.K., and, uh, and it's definitely one of my favorites. I'm I'm partial to Maltesers myself, and having a bottle of water is good. But the trick to it, there's no head on a submersible, so right, there's no, no bathroom. bathroom. So you nope. drink the water toward the end of the dive. <laughs> Andy, did you tell us your favorite food? Well, my favorite food generally is uh, are burritos, anyone who knows me. Uh, but that's exactly the food I would not take on a service. <laughs> no. I was going to say, that would not be good. No burritos. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight. But the Hui team will try their best to post answers to more of your questions online in the coming days. Uh, before we close, I want to thank Andy, Mark, Vincent, and Orla for joining us this evening, and an extra special thank you to our guest host, James Cameron. Thank you also to my Hui colleagues who have been working very hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. And finally, thank you to all of you out there who joined us online. If you enjoyed this evening's presentation, we hope you'll tune in again next week on Wednesday, May 27th at 7.30 p.m. when we'll have our next event in our Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Ocean Encounters series. That event will feature Hui President and Director Mark Abbott, an aquanaut, conservationist, and documentary filmmaker Fabian Cousteau. He's the grandson of Jacques Cousteau. They'll be talking about the ocean's future, so please register and tune in for that. Before anyone signs off, we've got a couple of great short films for you. The first is a sneak preview of Mission Ocean X. Mission Ocean X, that's hard to say. That's the working title of a new series being co-produced for National Geographic by BBC Studios Productions and Ocean X Media, and Jim is an executive producer on that. Mission Ocean X is currently in production, and it has an expected launch date in 2022, so look out for that. 
The second film tonight is about Huey, and we'll introduce you to some of our many scientists and engineers and the fascinating work that they do. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you and enjoy the films. Unbelievable. hardwired to be curious. And when we can take that desire and give it the right tools, that's when incredible things can happen. The oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of the Earth, life, everything is connected. We are all linked in our research by our passion for the ocean. Hui is an amazing place, full of extraordinary people who are truly curious about the ocean, want to understand how it works. How it interacts with the rest of the planetary systems, how humans influence it. The physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the interaction with human society, it's all connected. What Hui does is it brings all those scientists together. The world's best talent in ocean sciences. We learn from each other, we develop opportunities together. It's a fourth multiplier, it feels like 130,000 scientists. I can pull together a team from either my department or other departments at HUI to really tackle any problem. Having all the support is what makes HUI unique and enables me to do good science. HUI is at the cutting edge of that mix between science and engineering and it allows us to ask questions that most other places can't ask. You can come up with ideas, put them into action, and actually deliver results all in a short time frame. Vehicle technology, AUV technology, seafloor instrumentation, sensor development. You get the world-class reputation, but you've also got amazing ships and engineering that allow you access to places that most other scientists can't get to. You can see further, you can go further, you can reduce your risk, and you can do it less expensively. It's really amazing for me to be able to walk out of my lab, cross the street, and get on to the research vessel that can take me anywhere around the world. I've been to remote reefs in the Maldives and the Micronesia. I've dived on both the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the East Pacific Rise, and very few people have actually been down there and seen that. We looked at these turbulent storms in the ocean and how they create upwellings and nutrients. We're able to collect samples and see how these systems change in real time. Just imagine you are diving, you are reaching the bottom of the sea mount. All of a sudden you see a cloud. As we get closer, we see these objects that were aggregated like in a mass, and you say, what is that? The sense of isolation, you can almost feel the ocean closing 
over your head as you submerge. You can learn a tremendous amount just by being in the environment. Some things have struck me in the middle of the night. It clicks and you're like, oh my gosh, this is something really huge. It's that aspect of discovery, finding out something new, something that's never been seen before, creates an incredible drive within Huey scientists, engineers, and technicians. It's such a compelling place to be so dynamic and so many opportunities that it attracts really smart and dedicated students and young scientists. I was reading those papers about amazing science that was coming out of Hui. Now that I'm here, I get to actually interact with the people who wrote those papers. The positive feedback and the collaboration finally made me decide, oh, I want to be a scientist. Oh, I can be a scientist. It's incumbent on us to perpetuate the cycle of education and research and discovery. People all over the world need to recognize the role that the ocean plays in their daily life. Even if they don't live near the coast, it affects weather, it affects food resources, it affects climate. The tides are changing, the temperature is changing, the salinity is changing. Climate change and overfishing are the biggest threats to coral reefs right now. How will the ocean respond to global warming? We have to understand our planet in order to be good stewards of it. We need to get the understanding into the hands of everyone from the general public to people responsible for making policy decisions. It's probably more important now than it ever was. We're very eager to provide answers for those critical questions that we must address now, and we have the tools and the means to provide these answers. This is the best place on the planet to do the sorts of things that we're doing institutions around the world look to Hui as a leader in pushing the envelope. Concepts that were developed here are understood as the basis for oceanography all over the world. I'm proud to be from Hui. There's no place on earth I'd rather be. We have the potential to change the world. It's not just about this planet, it's about life in the broadest possible terms. <laughs>